cost equity and, or inequality and poverty uh, is really good for Virginia. So the question is, why are we in this situation? Do we not have enough money to fix that, that, that leak in the roof now? Do we lack the resources? Do we lack the know-how to address all this? Do we lack the political and social will? I think we've got the social will. We, we don't want to encourage and see our children grow up in these tough circumstances. We don't want to make our future vulnerable. So the question is, why are we in this situation? There's a whole, whole other argument here. Is, is, it's pretty obvious, just like the, the question that we're answering today. It's pretty obvious. The affluent and the influential contributors dominate the agenda. So when you have rampant or no finance campaign, campaign controls at all, when you have a finance system where one person or maybe a couple brothers that can almost outspend entire political parties, okay, Let, let's face it. If I'm gonna make a big contribution to you, you don't think it's an investment and I'm gonna expect something? So you've got this rampant infrastructure that just won't quit and they're not investing in things that will address these issues. They're not investing in human capital or children or preschool or school lunches that are edible and good and healthy for our children. They're not uh, investing in, in student loan relief so that our students, when they, they graduate, aren't burdened by debt for 10, 15 years that frankly they should be using and spending and helping generate an even stronger economy. They're not investing, our priorities are not investing in infrastructure, rebuilding roads, public space, which we all know are absolutely needed, and we all know create jobs. We're not investing in green and infrastructure banks. Okay. Things that would really, really expedite, accelerate real change. They're not investing in 21st century industries and opportunities that we have right now. Offshore wind in, in Virginia or Maryland is a, a fantastic opportunity. Why aren't we doing that? It works well. In, in, in Denmark and many other countries, what's preventing us from, from investing here? Okay. What's preventing us from investing in local uh, uh, in development or waste management initiatives, which is a huge environmental and economic opportunity? What's preventing us from investing capital in local small businesses that create jobs? There's plenty of, the banks have plenty of money, why aren't they investing it here? Okay. It's all a matter of priorities because we are investing in things like the war on drugs, maintaining the dirty energy, fossil fuel, 20th century infrastructures. As a matter of fact, not only are we maintaining them, we're giving no strings attached subsidies to the tune of, as you see in your, your, your handout there, almost $479 a million dollars a year in Virginia. Do you think that if it was reused re, uh, for different priorities could help address some of these serious issues now? Remember, you know, repair the roof now before it becomes a, a real disaster for your entire uh, property. So we do all these things because the political system won't allow us. So you might think, oh, time to get out there, go to the Little League game, or enjoy your garden. You know, what, what can we do about this? Well, let's take a minute and talk about solutions. Can we do anything about this? And this is where, despite the topic and the reality of the situation, this is where I have a lot of hope because we can do something about it. Oh, it's not gonna be easy, of course. Nothing, nothing you know, worthwhile in life is easy, it seems. But what can we do about it? How do we, we battle this? Well, there's a number of ways that we can do it. We need to protect and expand, of course, our, our safety nets and programs, increase opportunities for working families. We need to greatly increase the 21st century uh, and investment, which happens locally and doesn't get shipped away. In the green economy, that's a huge opportunity for us. We need to put new income into the hands of people who need and will spend the money in the communities. So minimum wage workers who, who are working on po at poverty levels, even if they work full time, that's gotta change. Every other, other municipality or state that has raised the minimum wage has done quite well. As a matter of fact, the business community, if it doesn't suffer, it, it actually is good for business. From, from a business person and someone who is the executive director of a business council, I'd say, and we argue that that raising the minimum wage is not just a moral imperative, but it's really good for business. Okay. We need to give a little more tax relief to the middle class. 
and make the those that can afford it uh, you know, pay their fair share. You know, the tax rates in America today are, are incredibly low compared to, to say the 50s or the 40s or previous to that. So why do we keep pushing the, the need for wealth tax cuts? So how do we achieve all of this? Well, again, it's not, not gonna be hard, uh, very easy, but there, there's a number of things we can do. Well, the first thing we're doing already is we're coming out here, we're getting uh, informed, we're doing something about it. But there's some very practical things, and a whole different a number of areas. First, the political perspective or uh, uh, activities or work we can do is, is let's make sure that our political friends, even if they're always in the minority, which unfortunately I think they are in Virginia almost always, it seems, we need to let them know we've got their back. We need to let people who know that if they're gonna run for an office, that we will support them. And when they get in, we will make sure that they're gonna you know, be effective. We need to let politicians know who may not ever even think about voting for the, the needs of the, uh, of the impoverished and the uh, folks who are being hurt by inequality. And many times if they really uh, got educated, they'd be self-serving if they, they, they started voting in the, in the right way. We also uh, need to make sure that we help restore democracy. The ban on the box. Now, that didn't come from legislation. That came from, from the governor. That's great. We need to stop voting suppression efforts. Voter fraud, when, when has that been an issue? Okay. Well, it's been a great political uh, ploy that's been used very effectively throughout the country, and it works. It works. So we need to combat that. We need to fight for, for uh, campaign finance. Citizens United, come on. How do we fight that? Well, we have no choice, and we can beat it, but it takes a lot of work. How about activism? You know, there's a lot of activists out there. How about if we start working closely together? It's like we're the French Revolution or the resistance. We're out there, we have common enemies, but we are so busy doing our own thing that we don't always come together. So Saul's done a really good job of creating these coalitions. When we start raising our voices more collectively, then the politicians will, will, will begin to hear a little bit. We need to support populist movement. Elizabeth Warren. You know, why is she one of the first people that said that, that's put out that the, the, the system's rigged? Of course it's rigged. It's been rigged for probably, you know, mostly many. But it's only gotten into the main street public discourse that the system's been rigged. What a populist way to put that out there. And now a lot of people respond to that. And by the way, I don't, she's not going to run for president. Anyway. So, but if she keeps talking the way she is, she's going to encourage the rest of us to get up and start doing things. And that's really what's happening. So activism is beginning to really uh, kind of make a, a difference. Uh, we need to change marketing and consumer habits. You know, you vote by your pocketbook, that kind of thing. Well, if you start buying more locally and you start rewarding businesses that are, that are much more uh, sustainable and environmentally uh, friendly or much more locally based and don't take their tax dollars and shelter uh, uh, overseas, we can begin changing the economy. We need to really help put uh, a lot of investments in green and new renewable uh, uh, industries. There's plenty of that that can happen right here. Okay. When we start changing the economic dynamics, that's when the status quo will begin paying attention. Okay. We need to get corporate and business leadership to the table. I helped found the Chesapeake Sustainable Business Council, which is a partner with the American Sustainable Business Council, which some would call it sort of the alternative to Chesapeake or to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Because there's businesses out there that recognize that this is this degree of inequality and poverty affects everyone, and that businesses need to be part of the solution. In many cases, businesses can benefit by by being leaders on this. There's a real window of opportunity when they come out and support this. And finally, we need to think big. We have some serious problems. We have grandchildren whose existence, frankly, I, I fear. But perhaps we could do great things like we've done in the past. Remember the Marshall Plan? You know, after World War II, it was probably the biggest socialist program out there that America adopted that really helped Europe from the war and all that good stuff. It was a great successful program. So how did that happen? Well, we saw the need, but despite the, the anti-communist kind of rhetoric during the time, we invest in this because businesses realize, well, you know, rebuilding Europe and uh, helping get America back into on 
one speed after the post war was really good for business. And the end result was everyone benefited. In the 50s and the 60s, we saw the greatest economic uh, stability out there, the, the, the least poverty and inequality out there. We need a green Marshall Plan. We need old leaders like, like those sitting here today to take these kind of ideas and start pushing through. If we do that, then that hole in the roof will get fixed correctly and other things will be, will be will be remedied as well, so that the structure that we live in in that property, or in this case, the state or America altogether, can be something that will be a productive, fruitful situation for us for generations upon generations upon generations. So there is hope, folks. It's tough work. We've got to get it going. And things like this are one way to start doing it. Thank you very much for your time and effort. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'll be here afterwards.